Welcome to section 10 of metabolism. In this section, we'll be discussing the hexose monophosphate shunt, also known as the HMP shunt. This is also sometimes referred to as the pentose phosphate pathway. Let's get started. The HMP shunt has two key functions. First, it produces nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate, or NADPH. This molecule has several important functions. It's involved in the synthesis of cholesterol, steroids, and fat. It also protects the cells from oxidative stress, which we'll talk more about in a minute. And finally, it assists phagocytic cells by generating NADPH, which is used in the respiratory burst. The second function is the production of ribose 5-phosphate, which can be used to synthesize nucleotides. Okay, with this in mind, let's look at the pathway. This is the metabolic map provided in section one of metabolism. In this video, we're focusing on the HMP shunt. This pathway can be seen right here. Many of the pathways occur in the cytoplasm and the mitochondria. However, the HMP shunt occurs exclusively in the cytoplasm. This is important because if you are given a list of enzymes, you'd be expected to know which are only present in the cytoplasm versus which are present in the cytoplasm and the mitochondria. Okay, let's zoom up on the pathway. This is a detailed figure of the HMP shunt, which can be found in section 10 of metabolism. There are several reactions that occur in this pathway, but you really only need to be familiar with a couple steps. Notice that glucose 6-phosphate is shunted away from glycolysis in order to produce ribulose 5-phosphate. So recall from the video on glycolysis that this portion of the pathway represents a part of glycolysis. Also notice that one of the enzymes involved in the conversion of glucose 6-phosphate to ribulose 5-phosphate is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, or G6PD. This enzyme is incredibly important because it's responsible for the production of NADPH, and it's the rate-limiting step of the HMP shunt. Ribulose 5-phosphate can then be converted into ribose 5-phosphate by an enzyme that is relatively unimportant. Finally, ribose 5-phosphate can then either be utilized in the synthesis of nucleotides or it can be returned to the glycolytic pathway in the form of fructose 6-phosphate. Notice that the conversion of ribose 5-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate is catalyzed by the enzyme transketolase. This is an important enzyme because it requires thiamine, or vitamin B1, as a cofactor. This means that the activity of the HMP shunt can be decreased in patients with a thiamine deficiency. Also notice from the pathway that there are two arrows going between fructose 6-phosphate and ribose 5-phosphate. There's an intermediate here, but it's relatively unimportant, so it hasn't been included. Okay, with this in mind, let's discuss some of the key roles of NADPH. So again, NADPH has three major functions, as I briefly mentioned at the beginning of this section. Let's discuss reductive synthesis first. This is a figure from the section on fatty acid metabolism. Notice that NADPH, right here, is required for the conversion of malonyl-CoA to fatty acids. Therefore, patients with a G6PD deficiency may be unable to properly synthesize fat. Okay, now let's discuss how NADPH protects cells from oxidative stress. This is a figure showing the interplay between glutathione and NADPH, which can be found in section 10 of metabolism. Glutathione is present in red blood cells and protects the cell from oxidative damage. There are many triggers that result in oxidative damage. Some of these include fava beans, sulfa drugs, or infections. Regardless of the trigger, hydrogen peroxide is produced in the red blood cells. So I've shown here that fava beans, sulfa drugs, or infections can trigger the production of hydrogen peroxide in red blood cells. The enzyme glutathione peroxidase neutralizes the hydrogen peroxide into water and generates glutathione disulfide. In order for glutathione to be regenerated, NADPH must be used. Notice that glutathione reductase uses NADPH to regenerate glutathione. So in patients with a G6PD deficiency, NADPH cannot be produced, and thus glutathione cannot be regenerated, so red blood cells experience an increase in oxidative stress in the form of hydrogen peroxide, which results in hemolysis. So patients with a G6PD deficiency will have 
decreased NADPH, which will result in decreased glutathione, which will result in hemolysis. Okay, let's do a question. A 24-year-old male develops jaundice due to hemolytic anemia after digesting fava beans. A blood sample is drawn, which reveals the presence of bite cells. What mechanism explains the formation of these cells? Hopefully from the question stem, you notice that this patient has a G6PD deficiency. We can deduce this because he digested fava beans, which are a form of oxidative stress, which then resulted in hemolytic anemia. From the HMP shunt pathway, we can see that a deficiency of G6PD results in decreased NADPH. From this figure, we can see that decreased NADPH results in a decreased ability to regenerate glutathione. This means hydrogen peroxide is not able to be neutralized. The hydrogen peroxide reacts with hemoglobin, resulting in conglomerates of oxidized hemoglobin. These are also known as Heinz bodies. As these red blood cells travel through the spleen, the Heinz bodies are removed by splenic macrophages, which results in red blood cells that look like someone took a bite out of them. These are called bite cells. So as the Heinz bodies go through the spleen, the splenic macrophages damage the red blood cells, resulting in the formation of bite cells. Okay, now let's discuss how NADPH assists phagocytic cells. Recall from immunology that phagocytic cells, such as neutrophils and monocytes, use oxygen to create a superoxide anion. This can then be converted into hydrogen peroxide and then bleach. These substances can be used to kill bacteria. The conversion of oxygen to a superoxide anion is catalyzed by NADPH oxidase and requires NADPH. So I've shown that NADPH is converted into NADP+. Thus, patients with a G6PD deficiency will be unable to generate NADPH, and the respiratory burst will be affected, resulting in a weaker immune system. Okay, let's do another question. A patient has glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, but is still able to synthesize nucleotides. What compensatory pathway explains this phenomenon? Okay, let's pull up the HMP shunt pathway to answer this question. Notice that a deficiency of G6PD will result in decreased ribulose 5-phosphate. This is because this part of the pathway is irreversible. Notice the arrows which are only going in one direction. However, the lower part of the pathway shown right here is reversible. This means that even without ribulose 5-phosphate, cells will be able to convert fructose 6-phosphate into ribose 5-phosphate, which can then be used to synthesize nucleotides. So in answer to our question, patients with a G6PD deficiency will still be able to synthesize nucleotides due to the activity of the reversible part of the HMP shunt.